Hey, thanks for joining me at the table. Uh, we are going to play Pendragon, which is a coin game from GMT. Uh, okay, so I am not an expert at all coin games. Uh, I'm not going to be the player's aid and give you a 20 minute, yeah, we like it video, which is basically what they do in every one of their videos. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually going to play a full game of this. And uh, I did do a quick search. I think some people have played the, um, the playbook, which is just a mini get your feet wet scenario kind of thing. Uh, and I don't even think they even went far. They just did like the couple of turns that are covered in the playbook and they never finished it. I'm gonna show you how to play this solo with the bots. So uh, this is gonna be a meaty playthrough. It's gonna take a while. Um, if you're interested in just jumping straight to the play, uh, go to video two. Uh, I'm going to try to um, show you how to set this up. And um, I may have to duplicate a few things because I think once we get to the playthrough, we need to talk about the how do you win. Actually, I'll try to skip that now and I'll save that for video two. <clears throat> but basically, uh, Pendragon is the uh, fall of the Roman the Fall of Roman Britain is what it's called. Um, it says it right on the box. So this is uh, Britain during the time that uh, Rome occupied uh, most of it. And so what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be setting up four factions. This is a four faction coin game. So uh, there's gonna be a couple of things. If you're familiar with coin games, some things are gonna be boring to you because I'm gonna try to explain this to folks who've never played a coin game. Um, and then I will also uh, okay, so what coin games have I played? I personally own and have played, um, oh my gosh, I own them and I'm drawing a blank. The, the American Revolution one, which I actually like. I don't understand the rules as well as I understand the rules for this, especially with the bot. So I'm a little nervous this showing that one to you. Um, but uh, I actually really like what that one tries to do. Uh, the things people have explained with the Gandhi one looks cool, but I was shy and I didn't back that one. Um, the other one is the two-player one. I'm drawing a blank, but it's I think it's Libya, um, French Algier uh, area, war. I uh, can't remember the exact name, but it's a two-player one. And I got that because a buddy of mine and I uh, Felt like that was more fun to play because then we didn't have to control AI bots or anything or control multiple factions. So it's a great two-player game. I will have to say, though, that as far as playing solitaire goes, you would think that in that game you're just controlling one bot. Um, I actually found that one to be extremely difficult to play solo. And um, it's largely because the AI bots uh, for that one are older. And here's another thing that I'm learning. The, the more modern the coin games get, the better the documentation that comes with it. So the bots, I think, are effective no matter what game you buy. Um, but uh, these later ones have, in my opinion, easier to follow, easier to understand, easier to read uh, bot charts. And I'll show you what those look like in a second. So uh, as far as setup goes, uh, we, we, we have four factions in this. We have the, and I'm going to pronounce these wrong. This is all like Latin stuff, and there is like in the back of one of these books, I think it might be the playbook, there's a teach yourself how to speak uh, Latin and it tells you how to pronounce everything. Um, fat chance that I'm gonna get that right. <laughs> but if I understand it, this is called the Kivitatis. Um, I, I have to be careful because my friends call it the, <laughs> the civic titties. Um, but, um, it's the Kivitatis, I think, or Kivitates, or whatever you want to pronounce it. I know that's a K sound. That much I can tell you. Um, and what this is, is this is actually just the local barons, the local lords. They're, they're true British people, but they're loyal to, you know, Rome at the time the game starts. But they're their own faction. These are the local uh, British people, okay? <clears throat> then you have the Dukes, which is D-U-X. Um, this is the Romans, or what's left of the Ro Roman Empire has collapsed, by the way. So this is what is left of the Roman Empire. But so they still have a strong 
uh, foothold here in Britain. Uh, you know, maybe Rome is burning, but these guys are still loud and proud. Um, <clears throat> what's really interesting about this game is these two factions are basically allied at the start of the game, but they have completely separate winning conditions. And that's, I think, the coolest thing about coin games is their winning conditions are very different. Now, um, uh, as a general thing for you to understand, the Duke are going to start on this game extremely powerful. And then they're going to gradually get weaker over time. And everybody else is going to start off weak, and they're going to gradually get stronger. And it's very interesting. I mean, it doesn't mean that the Duke can't win the game. Uh, but you basically are starting a game where you you have everything and you're just trying to hold on to what you have. Whereas everybody else is trying to build and take away from the Duke. So uh, it's a very interesting concept. Uh, you'll get into it more when we start playing. Uh, the next thing is uh, we have the Scotty, which are a barbarian faction. And um, they are, uh, well, let me show you the next one. We also have the Saxons, which is also a barbarian faction. So we have barbarians that are going to be invading from the sea. And then, of course, the Scotty are going to be invading from the sea on the other side or coming down through the mountains in the north or, you know, from Ireland, etc. Um, so, again, we have two barbarian factions, but they also both have completely different victory conditions. Uh, what's really interesting is that the uh, Saxons want to settle the land. I mean, they're, they're raiding and pillaging and doing all the barbarian-like things, but part of their victory conditions is they want to settle the land, whereas the Scotty, on the other hand, they just want money. They're all about money. And, um, and so you have to be really money-focused with them. Um, so that brings up the next thing. If you are familiar with other coin games, this coin game has the concept of money. Um, it has an economy, whereas the other ones don't. And for that reason, I like this one more than the other ones. Um, it's really funny, but this was the first coin game I ever played, and every other one has disappointed me, except for maybe the, the 1776 one, uh, but that's largely because I just really like the theme of that one. I, it's just so rich. Um, <clears throat> the, um, the other coin games uh, are a lot of just, you do actions to remove cubes or put cubes on. And um, I really find that that gets a little boring. Uh, this one has true economy stuff going on. Not like, it's not like a, it's not going to replace some economic, you know, games that are out there. But it really takes it to a new level and I love it. Um, I am very interested, like I said, in trying the Gandhi one. Because there's peace factions and I just think that's got to be an awesome concept to have factions that are totally focused on peace. Um, uh, that, I think, would be very interesting to try. And maybe someday I will pick that up. Um, <clears throat> my problem with coin games is that the AI bots are extremely... Oh my gosh, I feel like I went to work after I'm done using them. And um, in some respects, they're not even that good. And here's where I'm going to go with this. We're going to set up that we're going to play the British factions. So we're going to be the Kibitatis and the Duke. And we're going to play both of those. Okay? That's going to be the human player. Now, there's a rule later in the game that when this uh, concept called fragmentation happens, um, and what that means is that they're no longer allied once fra fragmentation happens. So they break apart, or actually these guys break apart and basically declare independence from the Duke. Okay? That happens during fragmentation. So when and if that occurs, I have to give up one of the factions. And the rules are, I give up the one that's winning. So I have to take on the one that's losing in terms of scoring, you know, points. So, um, so even though I'm going to be controlling two factions, I eventually have to whittle down to one, and I have to play whichever one is losing of the two. So I can't just, like, you know, make the Duke's cream of the crop and then say, oh yeah, I'm gonna just give, you know, these kibitatis away later. That doesn't, that's not how the rules work. So, um, so that's one thing. <clears throat> now, uh, a disappointment with this game is you can also play as the barbarians, 
which I actually find to be fun to play. The Barbarians are um, very cool in terms of what you get to do and how you get to do it. The problem is, is the AI bots for the, for the British factions stink. So if you play as the Barbarians, you're going to find it to be an extremely easy experience. Um, now, if it's your first game, I highly recommend that you play as the Barbarians. Um, but as you get better at this game, you're going to find that you can smoke the AI quite easily. Um, the AI bots for the uh, British factions is quite poor. Um, <clears throat> now, with that said, uh, the British or the uh, Barbarians are the same deal. Eventually, at some point, they fragment away and you have to give up one of them. Whichever one's losing uh, is one you keep. So it's a similar type of rule. You're not going to get to play both Barbarians to the end, um, <clears throat> but you could control both. Now, another way to play is you can just control one of the four factions and then AI bot the other three. I don't recommend that at all. I actually recommend that you play as the two uh, Barbarians or the two British and then whenever the time comes, you, you splinter off. Uh, that to me is much more fun. Um, I mean, obviously it's your game, play it as you want, but there's nothing stopping you from, from doing that. Um, <clears throat> I know some people have given me feedback, I take too long, but I hope this information is helpful and I'm trying to get through it as quickly as I can. There's a lot of information. This video is not gonna be short um, as far as the setup goes. There's a lot going on in this game. And I'm not going to go through every single thing, but even with the little bit we need to get started, there is still a lot going on in this game. Okay, so um, so we covered at least what the four factions are, and um, <clears throat> there are different scenarios you can play in the rulebook, but the one main scenario, which is the uh, full game, and I think it's just called the full game, uh, the Exidio Britannia, um, the full game is my recommendation of what you should play. Uh, I think that's really what the game was designed to be, and that's what we're gonna do. And then the full game, on the very back of the rule book, it shows you the complete setup, which is awesome. I am so happy they did this. This saves you so much time. Uh, otherwise, you have to go through and look up this color-coded nonsense, which is a lot harder to do. <clears throat> okay. So now, as far as uh, what materials do you need to play solo? Um, I've played this game multiplayer as well, by the way. So I have actually quite a bit of experience with this game. It's been six months since I've played in any fashion. So I am hoping and praying I don't screw up the rules too much. Uh, they do get rusty. I mean, you forget stuff. It's amazing. Um, but I have played this game quite a few times. First and foremost, uh, just like all GMT games, which I am so grateful that they do, they give you one piece extra of every component in the game. So just put those in a bag and never open it. Um, so that's gonna go immediately right back in the box. Um, and I put this in here to remind me that these are the bonus pieces. Um, <clears throat> the component quantity matters in this game. So you don't wanna be playing with those extra components in the game. Don't think that you can just mix it all in and it's no big deal. Okay, next. Um, uh, you're going to need all the, the pieces and bits. We'll get into that. Uh, but getting into the sheets here, uh, these are uh, the player sheets. So, for example, every player gets one of these. And if you're the Kibitatis, um, these are your actions that you get to do. And then you open it up. And there's one for the Saxons and Scotty. And then, of course, the Duke on the end. So we're going to need one of these for ourselves. So I'm just going to go ahead and set that aside. So we need that. But you don't need the other three, right? Because there's this is a four-player game. And so they give you four copies of that. And so I'm just reaching in and grabbing the other three copies because we don't need those. So for the other three players, we can put those back in the box. All right. <clears throat> you do need... The non-player one. This is your AI bot chart. Look at that flow chart. Look at all that gobbledygookiness. Goes all the way down. So this is for the Kibitatis. Um, so what is it that I don't like about them? The barbarians, you sort of raid and run. Raid and run. And these guys don't do a good job of preparing for the raids or protecting against them. Or even taking territory back that you've ravaged. 
Um, that's the reason why the AI bots, in my opinion, are a little bit weak. But like I said, it's here, and you definitely get to, to enjoy it if you'd like. You, there's only one of these, because obviously if you're playing solitaire or even with other players, you only need one of these to control the AI bots. And so we're going to be doing the Barbarian factions as AI bots. And eventually, one of these will be AI bot, because we have to eventually splinter. And so we're going to be using this sheet, uh, this side and that side. And yes, even though they're both Barbarians, they still behave very differently. So um, definitely using that. Next, we have the non-player event instructions. Okay, this looks like a big, nasty chart, but trust me, it's actually quite easy to use, and I'm very, um, I'm very pleased with what they did with this one. Okay, so every one of these cards is an event. We haven't gotten into those yet, um, but we're going to be drawing events, and, and things are going to happen. And so there's things that we do to either get the event card or to do a different action, right? You get to do an action or play an event. There's, there's a lot of choices in this game. And so how does the AI choose whether to play an event or not? And that's actually what this is. So it, what it's saying is, is like event 14 here, which has all kinds of, these has all kinds of names I'm never gonna be able to pronounce properly, but the Scotty will do this event if the first or second event card of this epoch and six plus war bands are on the map. So, I don't know how well you could see that. There you go. So there's some if statements here. So this event is interesting to the Scotty, but only if this condition is met. And then the Saxons don't give a flying rip about it, and neither do the Kibitatis. I'm never going to pronounce that. And in this one, um, the Duke do not play if later than the fourth event card of this epoch. Epic or epoch? You decide. I'm going to probably butcher both ways. So um, these event cards, some of them are conditional. Now, you may see these little symbols, and I used to know these inside and out, and now I can't remember. Um, I want to say that the uh, swords are your conditional ones, and the, um, uh, this little symbol means they don't want them at all, and I wanted to say that the shield meant that they wanted them, well, here we go. It's already up here at the top. Yeah, sort of special instructions. Yeah, this is do not play, meaning they, they don't, they're not interested in the event at all. This one is a priority play if it has the shield. Shield means they absolutely want to play it. So even though you don't see anything written here, they're, they're gunning for this. This is like top priority for the barbarians, these two events here. And then this one with the sword through it is it's still a priority play, but it has instructions which there's an example there. So it pays to actually pay attention to the top before you're trying to explain to your YouTube viewers how this is. So the symbols are actually super helpful. <clears throat> this, um, this sheet is only used for when you're trying to decide if the AI bots want, are interested in the event or not. So we're gonna set that off to the side. Uh, you're definitely using it, folks, just uh, not every turn. Um, the epoch round. Okay, so if you've played coin games before, like for example, uh, a perfect example is the um, the uh, American Revolution one. So American Revolution one is laid out in the way where you play spring, summer, fall, and then during the winter everybody takes a rest because you can't march armies and stuff in the winter. So during the winter people are resupplying, restocking, and a whole bunch of stuff happens. Well, this game is no different. There's, it's, but it's called an epoch, or epic epoch. I, I'm going to go with epoch. Um, so uh, a period of time passes by, and then the epoch ends. And each of those periods of time are represented by these cards. So what I have here is a full game is six stacks of 12 cards. The entire deck of cards is shuffled, and then you're just making six equal stacks of 12, okay? Now, the, um, the American Revolution one actually has um, time periods. So, for example, these first couple stacks are going to be, you know, you have to sort the stacks. They're special, right? Um, there's actually, like, certain cards that go in certain stacks with the uh, American Revolution. Um, you can't have, you know, the French joining the war on turn one, for example. Um, 
So that would be maybe later in the game. Well, this game is not like that. All these events are just completely equalized or equal uh, possibility. It's possible you'll get on this, you know, this top card here might be the best card in the game or the best card in the game might be all the way at the very bottom. So um, when you get through this card, these cards, and these 12 cards are gone, uh, there will be an epoch card. So we have a late epoch and then we have early. Okay, so I have two sets of cards here. One of those cards will show up and when they do, um, that triggers the end of the epoch, okay? So I hope that makes sense. When the epoch ends, we're gonna be doing a whole sequence of steps. Every one of these triggers when the epoch ends. We'll get into that in more detail. If you've never played a coin game before, it is extremely important to understand what happens during this epoch event. Now, if you're playing like the, the Revolutionary War game, they have their own version of that. I, I, I haven't ever played the Vietnam one, but I'm sure I'm willing to bet it's like some kind of like Tet, you know, the Tet break or the Tet effect. I don't know, I, I'm just guessing. But, um, but the point is, is, these coin games have these little um, uh, intermissions, if you will. That's a really nice way to put it. Like winter for that, or the end of the epoch here. And it's an intermission, and all kinds of stuff happens during intermission. And in this game in particular, the only time you check for a winner of the game is during this intermission. You cannot win the game until this intermission occurs. So all of the, the, the checks to see if you win the game, and then there's like stuff like, I call it God mode, where you're just coming in and sweeping through and destroying all these troops and I mean the whole map completely changes sometimes between uh, one uh, intermission and the next. So uh, it is extremely important for you to know these rules of what happens at the end of the epoch um, because um, that's going to dictate how you're going to play. Uh, if you're wondering, okay, what's my purpose? What's my objective? You're not going to know it unless you uh, have the epoch round understood. So all the things that are happening here are the things that, like, for example, if you're the Duke player, you're going to get to convert all your plunder carried by the Duke to Duke resources, one for one. You need to know that. You also need to know that you have to pay one resource to for maintenance for each fort that you have in the game. There's um, a lot of things like that that are going to just like, oh my gosh, I didn't know I needed to do that. So um, I didn't mean to belabor that so much, but you definitely need this sheet. This sheet is super valuable. I think there's two of them because, you know, in a four-player game, uh, you can have one for each side of the table, so you can just put the other one uh, back in the box. Now, on the back of the Epoch round is what's called the Battles, and I'll take you through that. This is also something new in the game that other coin games don't have, and it's also why I like this one more than the other. Most coin games are um, your cubes die. I get to remove three of your cubes. Boom. This one, you actually do a, a war. And some people complain it's a bit too mathematical. And I don't argue with that, because it is. It's very mathematical, but I like it. I like it a lot, Steve. I like pizza, Steve. So, um, uh, sorry, that's a movie reference. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, the last one is this uh, non-player guideline summary. Um, I don't really reference it very often, but it's very helpful when you're first learning the game. And then the thing that I think that's most helpful is this random spaces table. If you're trying to decide random, what you do is you roll a d6, and then um, wherever you're starting from, you then follow the arrow. So you're gonna go down this way, or down that way, or and then up, um, et cetera. And, and the whole idea is, is if you're looking for the next one, um, that satisfies the condition, you know, you start somewhere and, um, you know, because you roll a, a D4 and a D6, actually. So maybe we would start at Votadini, right? And so it says, like, you know, barbarians need to raid the next four random spots. Well, you would go down until you find a spot that qualifies for that barbarian raid. And so uh, random in this game, there's a very specific table that you follow for randomization. Um, it's not just oh, one to two is here and a three and four is there, okay? I hope that makes sense. And then, um, and then on the back here is some more of the, 
the information for battles, which I use this a lot. And then um, whether or not you can conquer a stronghold, this table, once you learn how to use it, you can figure out if you're gonna win the battle without having to do all the math in your head. Um, the table at first blush is really hard to understand, but over time it actually is really nice. Um, very well done. I think some people on Board Game Geek made an alternative one. I actually like the, I think the way the designers do, and so I like the way they did it. Um, okay, so as I said, we made the, um, what is it, six piles of 12 cards. So then um, the late Epoch cards, there's three of them. So you're just gonna shuffle those, and we're going to put them in the bottom three piles. Now, I haven't put them in the deck yet. I'm just gonna put them above the deck for now. Then the early ones, you can see that you have four of them in the game. One of them is gonna be out. So I'm gonna shuffle them, and then I'm just gonna remove one, and it's just gonna be out of the game. It's out of the game completely. So not even gonna be in this game. And then the other three, I'm gonna put on top like this. So now, uh, what you have to do is for each of these, you draw the bottom four cards, right? Because players can count and know that 12 cards are gone and they know the epic epoch's gonna end. But what they do is you're, you're gonna draw these four cards and then you're gonna take your epoch card, mix it in and then shuffle them. So now you know that the bottom five cards, right? Each, each deck now has 13 cards in it. And the bottom five cards, the Epoch card is in there, but you don't know which, which of the five it is, right? So if you're counting in your head and you're one of those people that just has to have that level of control over your game, um, then you know that once we get to the bottom five cards, or what would that be, nine through 13 of, of the pile, then there's a chance that the Epoch card's coming. Now, what you do with this is, obviously you put this back on the bottom, and let me do the next one here. And I've had some people argue, um, just to speed up, that you could just draw the top four cards because since they're all just randomized cards anyways, <laughs> like there's no reason it has to be the bottom four. Um, but from a shuffling perspective, I, I honor it. Um, okay, so we shuffled this one and we put it on the bottom of this. So now the idea is, is when you're done with all six decks, this one is going to go on top of that one, which will then go on top of the next one, etc. And the late era will be at the bottom. And you will have one giant mega stack of event cards. And there's going to be six epochs in there. Okay? Uh, I hope that makes sense. So I'm not going to make you watch me do all six stacks. I do need to do them, though. So I'm going to keep them on the table. Um, there's a few special cards here. Every player is going to get one, and you can see there's one for each faction. And um, what these are, I can't even remember what they're, they're called pivotal events. That's, thank you, they're, they're written right on the card. So every faction has a pivotal event that they get to use. And these are like game changers. Um, I will tell you that some factions get more awesome pivotal events than others. Um, the Duke, for example, is probably got the weakest pivotal event of them all, and I'm sure somebody will argue with me about it, and that's fine, I'll, I'll concede that you win. Um, but like the Barbarian ones are just friggin' awesome. And people want to play the Barbarians just so they could use them. I mean, they're just that awesome. Um, so, uh, and actually this isn't the Barbarian, these two are. Uh, okay, these are, you can use them one time in the game, and I'll explain them more when we get into it. But what's really cool with this particular game is only one of these pivotal events can be done at the start of the game, and I think it's the Scotties. They're the only ones that can use their pivotal event from the start of the game. Everybody else, see this little red text? Those are requirements um, that have to be in place. And so most of these players have to just sit and wait before they can use them. So what I like to do when I'm playing Solitaire, you need to know all four of these, by the way. You have to have them memorized because there's special rules for when the AI is gonna intervene and play these. Um, and uh, I'm actually drawing a blank on when that is. Um, I'm pretty darn sure, I'll, I'll look that up in a second. Um, it might actually be on their flowcharts. In fact, I think it is on their flowcharts. That's why I didn't worry about it too much. It's here. 
So So they have um, their event is here on the top left, and it says 8.1.3. So we'd have to go look that up in the rule book. Um, but that'll tell you when they're going to, um, oh no, right here it is. Here it is. So, so this is the, um, the pivotal event, and right here is when you play it. Play win. You would place at least one hill for it, and neither current nor next card has first or second. So, so those are the uh, situations, and they all have a little white box that tells you when they're going to use them. Okay, so uh, this one is the Kivitatis. I'll put that in like that. And then the Duke. Now, those are going to be ours. We're going to be controlling those. And then the, um, the two Barbarian ones... I like to put those somewhere where I can read them easily. So I just sort of like lay them here in the ocean because not a lot happens in the ocean anyway. So it's a pretty safe place to lay cards in this game. Okay, enough of that. Um, these are controlled markers. Um, at the start of the game, the everything is going to be under British control. And so all of these markers are going to go on the board, but this side up. As the Saxons start to take land, obviously it flips over. And then uh, there's also a possibility for the Scotty to control land. And then the Duke. They don't control land in the beginning. British control at the beginning of the game means that the Duke controls them. And there's this concept, like I said, called fragmentation, where, where they split apart and they no longer are friends with each other. And then and only then do the Duke actually start controlling land themselves. So, um, so you got, you know, these concepts, all of these will be used during setup. So I'm going to just set those aside. None of these will be in setup. We have, um, Federatis and these are, uh, just think of them as hired, hired guns. Um, these are just, uh, conscripts that are, um, paid for by the whatever faction. And it just means that the Duke controls them or the, um, uh, the Kivitatis control them. And what's interesting is the Federati are typically barbarians. So you're going to have, like for example, this could be a barbarian Saxon troop that's controlled by the, um, they're, they're basically taking money from the Britons to, to work for the Britons. And um, the Kivitatis. And uh, they'll actually fight their own clan of barbarians. I mean, they're, they're just mercenaries. Um, but uh, you have to pay for them, and if you fail to, and then there's all these crazy events where the Federati actually flip sides and betray you, and there's stuff that happens. So uh, anyway, that's just something to understand. Uh, you don't start the game with any of those. And then this is just a simple thing. Um, I'm going to grab here. So this is their um, pivotal event. And you can see here, there's this uh, little symbol here. And it says, hills or homes, blah, 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 get epoch round revenue from hill forts, not towns. Um, this little symbol means until the end of the game. And so what you do is you, uh, you tend to put these on to show whether it's uh, this symbol or that symbol. Now, you might be wondering, why does it have both on them? Because um, most event cards... I'm just going to grab one from this deck down here. It has a light side on the top and a dark side on the bottom. So what you do is you put this on, and if it's the dark side, then you're saying that this event is what's triggered. Or you flip it over and to say that that event is what's triggered. It's a nice little reminder to, to tell you which event is active at the time. Um, they're very helpful tokens. Now, um, Obviously, on this one, there's no need to know light versus dark, so it doesn't matter which side's up. Um, <clears throat> but just so you know, these are until the end of the game. And then the little ship, you can see there's a little ship here. Uh, that is until the end of the epoch. So sometimes you get a benefit that's only temporary, and other times you get a benefit that lasts you for a long time, which you want to get those early, right? Um, the ones that benefit you till the end of the epoch are useless if you know you're in the bottom five cards, right? And the epoch's going to end any time now. 
uh, but they're perfect to get early in an epoch. So, so there's some timing with these events, and you'll play some games where the timing just never works in your favor. So um, that's a lot. There's a lot of that randomness in this game, and uh, the one thing I liked about the 1770, the Re Revolution one, is um, the cards were more specific to each era, and so um, uh, I don't know. It just it didn't feel as random as this one, um, but random is good sometimes. So don't let me don't quote me that I hate this game because I don't mind it. It's it's a long game. Uh, and like I said, the bots wear me out a little bit. Okay, so these are tokens you don't use at the start of the game. You are going to uh, also have these. You don't need those at the start of the game. And all that is, is let's start talking about the board now. The board is going to have various things on it. And I know it's sort of upside down and I apologize, but it's easier for me to read and manage. Um, let me move the camera this way. That might help. So let's look at uh, like Dobruni here. Okay, so Dobruni has a control marker. So it's gonna start the game under British control. I know that uh, without even looking at the map, but we have this little map here that um, tells us, and you can see Dobruni is under British control. You can see the four gold, uh, four gold tokens. You can see that the Kivitatis have a town there and then two troops, okay? So let's, that's what you're going to do during the setup. You're going to have to go through, and every province, you're going to have to find the right piece, put it out, put out four of these. This represents the wealth of the territory. When barbarians raid, they're going to actually steal these. And then if they can carry them all the way back home, then that's how they get their money. It's a very cool concept. And um, and so we would also put two of these on like so. It doesn't matter where they're located. And what it, what's important that you have to understand is that there's gonna be one location for a town that's empty. So that's uh, the important. Not all provinces are gonna start like this, but this particular one, you're gonna go through province by province everywhere, set all that up and then you're also going to, there's two towns in the game, Londinium and uh, Iberacium, which, uh, it's what, that's somewhere in Scotland. Oh, why am I drawing a blank? I play EU4 all the time. It's the Scottish capital. Uh, dang it, uh, it'll come to me. But, um, and anyways, these two towns are really difficult to ever conquer. I, I've never seen anybody actually conquer one. Um, so they're usually, um, uh, they're really nice strongholds that keep you, st at least some of your wealth, safe. Um, last but not least are these tokens, and you're going to use all of them. Um, <clears throat> so the dice are just the dice, and they are color-coded, which is pretty cool. Like, these two dice are typically used by the uh, Saxon player, whereas the Scotty typically uses these three, and the Kivitatis has one, and then the Duke player has one. Now, I tend to just use all of them, uh, and there's nothing special about them other than the color. So this is a, a um, you know, eight-sided die. This is also an eight-sided die. There's nothing unique or different about them other than the color, but every player can get one, so that's pretty cool. Um, we have a lot of tokens here, like this. These are used for controlling the AI bots. They're reminders for you. So what you can do is you can say, okay, I need to, I'm gonna attack here. You have to declare your action before you execute your action. So you can identify everywhere that you're going to attack. So that way, uh, cause sometimes you have to pay money for each action you do. And so then you can say, okay, that's two, four, six gold. And then you pay your gold and then you execute your actions. So these are just markers for when you're doing your actions to remind you of what you are or are not doing. And then the different color is just used because there's sometimes a secondary action. So uh, you use it for that. And then I can't remember what the red one's for, but we'll figure it out. Uh, there's blue one. Oh, I, I remember. Red and blue. These are special. Everything's special. Okay, so I'm going to grab some of these and move them over because we're going to... 
Look at these special. And you can clearly tell I played multiplayer last time because one of these is in here, but none of the other ones are. I always put those in here. So whoever played the blue player must have been me. Everybody else <laughs> didn't do it. It's okay. Uh, I, I'll still invite them back someday. All right, so here's the ones for the black player. And then there's two for the red player. And two for the Scotty. And, oh, I already got the blue. Okay, so let's rock and roll with this. So um, I know I got half the map covered and I'm not gonna show you how to set up every single province. Um, just trust me that the, the back of this is all you need, okay? It tells you almost everything you need to know. Uh, actually, it, I would probably go as far as saying it does tell you everything you need to know. Okay, the first thing that you're gonna do is we have the sequence of play and all four factions get a token here. <clears throat> so that is first and foremost. The sec next thing that happens is everybody gets a token um, uh, basically for their money. Remember, this game has an economy. So the Duke player starts off with zero dollars. And you may be thinking, oh my God, that's awful. But the Duke player gets to spend the blue player's money as if it were his own. <laughs> so it's pretty devious, this game. And uh, the blue player starts with 25. And let's see, black and green. Black will start at 10. And by the way, there's a, um, if you look real close at the board, I put this down so it's a little bit steady. Right there on the six, you see that little green? That little green means that that's where he starts the game. And then on the 10, you can see there's a little black. And I'm betting on, well, zero doesn't have one for the Duke. Yeah, that, it's only for the barbarians. And I guess that makes sense because between every epoch, they actually reset to these values. Um, well, sort of. Uh, they'll reset to them if they're actually less than that value. Okay. So then we just keep going. So um, most of these markers are for uh, indicating things in the game. So for example, how much Duke control do we have? Right now, we have zero. So they start on the zero. Because remember, the Duke and the British are allied. They haven't fragmented yet. So the Duke don't control anything. The British control everything. Okay, so the next one is how much is the Kivitati's wealth? And so you'll have a little token that looks like this. Uh, that's also zero. And one of the things that leads towards fragmentation is as the Kibitatis get wealthy, then they decide, hey, Romans, we don't need you anymore. So, um, but they start at zero. Okay, next is the Saxon control. And of course, they don't control anything either, so they're zero. So there's a lot of stuff that piles up at the zero marker there. Next around is at 36. Okay, so this is another interesting concept in the game. I'm gonna to try to zoom in for you. All right, so hopefully you can read this here. It says Britain control Roman rule. Okay, I haven't gotten into any of that yet. What does Roman rule and all that other stuff mean? But this little marker here is saying that if you pass this marker, which is at 36, the blue player will win the game. Remember, they win it at the epoch phase. They don't win it just during regular gameplay. But this is their winning condition, okay? So this is a nice little reminder of what their winning condition is. Okay, now, I'm gonna spin you a little bit. Oh my gosh, look here. There's one for fragmentation. So when fragmentation happens, the British win condition drops from all the way up here, all the way down to there. So that's where the other one is. So you would, uh, well, there's a, another blue marker, which is meant to indicate the win condition, but we knock it over because that one's not active. Um, but it's there just as a reminder. And um, I really love this game. I mean, first of all, they give you these blue and red markers as reminders, 
but also you can see that there's the red uh, bar on there as well. So they give you multiple reminders. It's a very well uh, thought through game. Now, I'm having a little bit of a cow because I actually don't know what the second one is for. I need to figure that out because the red one, they only give you one. Um, so it's all the way up here at 75. <laughs> so the red one is all the way up here at 75 and you can see it says prosperity plus prestige under Roman rule. Okay, and we'll get into what those mean. I'm trying to save that for video two when people are actually watching the gameplay. Okay, so we're gonna keep going now. Uh, there's some refugee markers. We don't use these. So let me zoom back out. We don't use these yet. Those are part of events. So I can put those actually out of this. Okay. Oceanus Septentrio, okay? So this is Oceanus Septentrio. So um, I'm not real good with my Latin, but it's this up here. And um, I think at the start of the game, uh, what this represents is the Roman Navy and whether or not they're patrolling the ocean for barbarians, of course. So um, if you look on here, you can see right here, no patrol, no patrol, that one's patrolled. And let me scroll out a little bit, and this one's patrolled. So these two are patrolled, those two are not. So um, this is already highlighting a key thing in the game. The um, the Scottish, the areas they get to raid have no navy, whereas everywhere the Saxons are raiding is patrolled. So it's very interesting. So uh, what you do is you put this marker anywhere in the ocean. I try to make it so uh, it's not going to get hidden by every, everything else, so it's not under patrol. Then uh, Germanicus is under patrol, and I like to put that one right there next to the uh, town. And this is, um, well, let's just finish off these. This is Hibernicus, which is the um, over by Ireland. And yes, there's no patrol, so we can put that here or even here. Oh, well, yeah, we'll do here. Okay, and then the last one uh, is patrolled. It's Britannicus. This is really just the English Channel, and I like to put it somewhere around there, just as a reminder. Um, okay, keep going. This is just for tracking the epoch round. So we would put that right here. Actually, I put it like there, because the epoch round has not started. And when it does, you go down, and then you go down like this, and then you recover and reset, okay? And then you play more game. The roads maintain. The roads are maintained right now. Uh, they do eventually deteriorate. Uh, so then that would flip over to show that it's not maintained. There's the Imperium marker, okay? It's just a little Imperium symbol. And what that is, is that starts under Roman rule. And we need to discuss what this is. And I'm going to do that during gameplay, not during setup. But uh, Roman rule is where we start. And it's Roman rule. You'll notice that there's two Roman rules. This is Roman rule on the Duke side, which is military dominance or civilian dominance. So there's two sides. Okay, and then last but not least, we have we have the Duke Prestige. We have a Control Plus Prestige or Prosperity Plus Prestige. Okay, so right now, the Duke win the game if they have Prosperity Plus Prestige, so we use this side. Eventually, as the game starts to crumble, um, it flips to Control Plus Prestige. Okay, um, so this is the uh, marker for determining whether they win. Um, this is a marker uh, just for controlling prestige, and this is a marker for total prosperity. So, uh, let me put all this stuff aside. Uh, one of the things I can tell you with certainty is this game has a quantity of 10. So, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 
eight, nine, ten. These ten are going to start out of the game. Everything else is going to go on the board at the start of the game. All that wealth is on the board. So we're going to use every one of those gold cubes. These ten will not be used. Okay? They're just extra for in case we need extra wealth to put on the board. Um, and like I said, that's a controlled quantity. So if we run out of these, then we don't get to do any more. I have never run out, by the way. I have used them, but I don't run out of them. Okay, so now we get to uh, total prosperity is exactly 80. So if you just did quick math, um, that means there's 90 of those cubes. So you should be able to count 90. It is critically important you have 90, okay? So total prosperity is 80, because 80 is going on the board with 10 that are going to be just off the game, but they're available, okay? The prosperity plus prestige is also going to be 80, because their prestige at the start of the game is also 0. And I'm looking real quick. Yeah, the Duke Control isn't really necessary, because see how it says total prosperity? On the other side, it says Duke Control. Here it says total prosperity. On the other side, Duke Control. So technically speaking, uh, what you do is you use the prosperity tokens, and then once you need the flip to control, you flip them over to control. Okay, that's, I think, the, the way they're supposed to be used. Um, if this prosperity goes above 80, which it can, then you would use this side. So I was wrong. Uh, it's the Duke Prestige that goes to the zero marker. This one you could just set over here with the, the rest of the stuff. Okay, um, <clears throat> with the exception of putting all the pieces on the board, which like I said, you follow this to a T. Um, and then I also need to shuffle my decks. I will do that between videos. Um, this was a 52 minute game setup and um, uh, I'm not surprised. This is quite a, quite a game. And um, be mindful that some of the towns and whatnot are going to start in the uh, little box here. And um, just a real quick uh, little pointer, uh, that eight, all that means is that uh, eight of them are on the board. So when you need to count how many are on the board, you can just look here and look at the, the highest blank number, and you don't have to bother looking on the board to count. I really appreciate them doing those nice little touches. They're super fine touches. So uh, anyways, um, I'm going to go ahead and finish this setup, and then we'll do uh, video two. Um, thanks for watching. Stay awesome. I hope you enjoy the series.